Allow me to start uh, by briefly introducing myself. My name is Cristina Andrea Moraru. I am a science communicator focused on the mystifying and popularizing explorations of spirituality through science. I hold a bachelor degree with honors in psychology from the University of St. Andrews in the UK, and I also hold a master's of science in educational studies from the University of Leuven in Belgium. I have over 10 years of experience in communicating research insights to both academic and non-academic audiences. And today I would like uh, to start off by inviting you to contemplate um, two questions. The first one being, has there um, ever been anything that happened to you that you couldn't quite explain? Uh, so just some examples um, of what that might have looked like. Perhaps you were thinking of someone and then they ended up calling you a couple of seconds later. Um, perhaps you were going to work and although you always tend to take the same route, for some reason you had the feeling you needed to take a different route this time and in hindsight you found out that you avoided an accident or a traffic jam um, or perhaps you have dreamt um, of something that actually came to pass. Uh, so this is the first question that I am inviting you uh, to think about and the second question would be do you know anyone who experienced something like this that they couldn't quite explain? And I would like to start us off from here by sharing two of my own experiences that I couldn't explain. And the first one that I would like to share with you happened when I was a child. I do not remember exactly how old I was. Uh, all I know is that I was definitely younger than 11. and. We had, uh, we being my family and I, so I was living with my parents, we had a relative that would visit us um, not often, uh, actually quite rarely, uh, but what would be so special about their visits uh, would be that they would never uh, announce it ahead of time. So we wouldn't know that they're actually coming until they were physically in front of the door ringing the bell. Um, and I remember um, dreaming about this relative several times as a child and then actually having them visit us the next day. And as a child, I didn't think that was weird at all. Um, I think children tend to take things as they are. Um, however, as an adult looking back, that does strike me um, as an unexplainable sort of event. Um, the second experience uh, that was out of the ordinary that I would like to share with you uh, is from my adult life. And this happened back in 2015 um, on Halloween night. I um, had this dream and I remember it um, vividly because up to that point I dreamt of nothing of the sort, um, that my body was catching fire and I remember having this first person perspective, looking down at my, at my body, looking down at my palms and seeing them catching fire and seeing my body catch fire up to my neck. Um, and I remember waking up and thinking that was odd. Um, Late, because I'd never dreamt of fire before, it was, it was a, a very out of the ordinary dream for me to have. Um, later on that day, I found out that um, during the same night, unfortunately, in my hometown um, in Bucharest, Romania, uh, the deadliest fire in the history of the country had taken place, killing over 60 people and injuring a hundred more. There was no way for me to know that, um, having happened the same night, and moreover, I hadn't lived there at that point for five years. Um, so I was in Belgium at the time completing my master's degree. And to me, um, so many people around the world and across time have these sorts of experiences and to me they evoke a sense of the mystical, of the spiritual, uh, because to me it, they seem to indicate that I am more than my body. Um, and that's a very interesting question. Um, why do these experiences occur and what do they mean about what it means to be human? 
The first time that I would receive a scientific perspective on this was uh, in the during the last year of my bachelor's degree in psychology. So in my fourth and final year, we were given the option of choosing a number of courses according to our own interests. And one of these courses was titled The Psychology of Religion and Belief. And to me, um, having been raised with religious Christian influences and also with spiritual influences and having um, a deep interest in human behavior, that course really uh, attracted me. So I enrolled um, and I was excited to be in it. However, it didn't take long until I discovered that I wasn't com I wasn't really satisfied with the body of research that was presented and the reason for that was that it all started from this assumption that of course there is no such thing as God so why do people believe in a God what else is happening there um, and I recall us um, discussing this theory that um, in a nutshell argued that um, our propensity to believe in God, our tendency to believe in God, um, comes uh, is simply an unintended side effect of traits that have helped our ancestors survive. Um, and while I believe um, that uh, this um, line of inquiry has its value and should continue, um, to me it felt incomplete. I felt there was more um, that one could do from a scientific perspective to answer these questions that I had a deep interest in, um, such as um, what is the meaning of life? Is there a meaning to life? Is there such a thing um, as God? And at the time, I took um, my experience to mean that this is simply the scientific way to look at things, to assume that there is no God um, and go from there. Um, it would take five more years until I would be uh, presented with a different scientific perspective. And this came to me in the form of a book. Um, the title of the book was An End to Upside Down Thinking, Dispelling the Myth that the Brain Produces Consciousness and Its Implications for Everyday Life. Um, and as you might have noticed, the title is quite controversial. Um, what do you mean, dispelling the myth that the brain produces consciousness? Does the brain not produce consciousness? Is that not an established fact? Um, and this book would go on to present evidence from different bodies of research that uh, seem to point uh, towards this um, representation of consciousness as not being limited nor by time nor by space, um, as not being limited to the brain, as potentially uh, being able to survive bodily death. Um, and all of these things to me were so reminiscent of uh, teachings from religious and spiritual traditions about the idea of an afterlife or the idea of a deep interconnectedness between all there is, um, between us all being part um, of one consciousness and the idea that if I do anything to hurt another person, I am essentially hurting myself. Um, and I was fascinated by this because I could finally see a bridge in between these two worlds that I couldn't reconcile over the years. Um, one of them being this scientific camp where um, I got trained in, um, where I got professional experience in, and that taught me to be skeptical, to demand evidence. Um, and I wasn't willing to let go of that, however, it seemed that uh, this uh, camp, if you will, wouldn't address uh, these deep questions about life that I had. Um, then on the other hand, um, the, if, we, if I were to go towards the spiritual camp, so to speak, uh, there would be a lot of answers, but I wouldn't be satisfied um, with uh, the lack of evidence that I was perceiving. And 
it felt like there was really no place for me in either camp, that I was stuck in this limbo, that now, um, going through the body of research presented in this book, I could see that there is a world there as well, that there is perhaps um, a place um, where I belonged uh, in the way that I look at the world and in the way that I ask questions and expected answers um, about things such as the meaning of life, if there is one. Um, and this book to me was a permission slip um, to go and explore further. Uh, so what I did, um, I was honestly a little bit ashamed of my interest in spirituality at the time. I thought I should do better than giving into this human tendency to believe in God, to be um, more mindful of this bias and stick with the science and stick with the evidence. But now I could see evidence uh, that was dovetailing with uh, spiritual teachings that I was familiar with. So. This really intrigued me and I started shyly in the beginning and more daringly as I progressed to sign up on a newsletter here, go to this webinar there, um, take up a course here and this whole new world opened itself up to me uh, where I could learn ab about um, contemporary insights on the nature of consciousness, on altered states of consciousness, on um, psychedelic experiences. Um, on um, a phenomena that seemed to be paranormal, such as telepathy. Um, and the more I read, um, the more I was intrigued um, about this um, evidence pointing at a reality that we're not at the um, present moment conventionally accepting, but neither bringing it into question that it almost feels taboo uh, to talk about some of these things. And uh, what kind of things am I referring to? Well. Let me walk you through three uh, bodies of evidence that seem to point to this idea that I mentioned that consciousness uh, may not be bound by time nor space, uh, that it may survive bodily death, and that we may all be more interconnected than we think. Um, the first body of research refers to uh, parapsychological research. And parapsychology is the area of psychology that looks at um, phenomena that seem to be paranormal, that appear to be paranormal. Um, things that look like telepathy, like precognition, like premonition, like clairvoyance, and so forth. And when I um, started looking into this body of evidence, what struck me um, is very well summarized in this quote from Professor Jessica Utz, who is a former president of the American Statistical Society. So we're talking about an eminent statistician. And she said, and I quote, using the standards applied to any other area of science that uses statistics, it is concluded that psychic functioning has been well established. So an eminent statistician says that psychic functioning is well established, that the stats check out and that this is a thing. And I thought, oh my God, why, why don't we hear more about this? Um, and I will share a little bit later about why I think we don't hear more about this intriguing type of evidence. Um, but just before I do that, I want to uh, quickly walk you through the other two types of evidence that seem to point to consciousness being um, less bound than we previously think and less dependent on the brain than we currently think. And this second body of evidence that I um, want to bring up is um, uh, are the case studies of people who have near-death experiences. So certain people when they come very close to death and their brain activity is either very low or plain and existent, um, they have complex perceptions. Um, they report seeing what has been happening around the, their body in those periods where their brain was inactive. Um, and 
Uh, there are even cases when they report um, things that have happened kilometers away from their physical body. Um, and many of these cases have been verified by witnesses. Uh, the accuracy of these people's statements has been verified. Um, so this raises some important question marks around uh, the relationship between consciousness and the brain. Could it be um, that the brain does not produce consciousness as we currently think of the relationship between the two, but rather could their relationship be different from that? Um, is consciousness perhaps able to survive um, bodily death to exist independently of the brain activity to be its own entity um, if you will just as we have matter we might have consciousness for example um, these are new ways of thinking about consciousness but they are important ways um, and it's important to normalize talking about them um, and questioning our very fundamental assumptions about what consciousness might be um, so we talked about parapsychology, we talked about near-death experiences, and the third body of evidence that I want to point you to are the stories of children who, uh, of young children who claim to have had past lives and who tell stories of the people that they claim to have been. Stories that again, um, uh, there are cases in which researchers we're able to check out the accuracy of these statements about real people who have lived that the children could not have known about um, and even more astonishingly down to intimate details of those people's lives. Um, another thing that's very interesting is that some of these children have birthmarks. They have birthmarks that are corresponding to the ways in which the people who they claim to have been died. Um, so could the consciousness survive bodily death? Um, these are very big questions um, to ask. And again, uh, to me, as I was going through uh, this evidence and as I continue to go through it, it um, brings to mind these uh, teachings from religious and spiritual traditions about an afterlife, um, about interconnectedness, um, about... Um, the idea of, of loving um, one's neighbor and so forth. And these have huge implications uh, for everyday life and how we choose to live. Now, what's important to say um, is that I, um, I was aware of some of these things um, even before I dove uh, deeper into this body of evidence. I was aware, for example, of near-death experiences, but I always thought, well, I guess nothing really convincing has been found. I guess they were kind of all debunked, else we would have known, right? They, it, it has pretty huge implications if we can have a consciousness. Uh, and we can have complex perceptions uh, without a functioning brain. Uh, so surely we would have heard of it if, if this was a real thing. But when I looked at the case studies myself, and when I look at the evidence myself, the picture that gets painted is very different. The evidence is convincing. We need to start asking some questions and normalizing having these discussions. Um, and remember that I said, um, that I asked myself, why don't we hear more about this? And I think I, 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 the, I got my answer as I was um, going through this evidence because, or at least part of the answer, um, because these researchers that investigate these uh, areas, they don't necessarily have it easy. Uh, they lack the funding uh, to run their projects. Um, in the ways that are needed to advance their fields. Um, they could use more researchers on these topics um, to properly investigate the questions that come up and the implications that come up. Um, they receive rude remarks um, even from colleagues about their work about, and about what they choose to do with their expertise, about their areas of focus. Um, and we're talking about competent people um, 
upon listening to them firsthand, upon listening to researchers in these areas firsthand, I see competent um, researchers, intelligent researchers, um, people who take feedback, who take criticism, who implement it, um, and who, as I said, uh, do this despite not having it easy, having unfair barriers sometimes um, in front of um, in front of them, and. Just to give you an example, there was a case of a study on mediumship um, that got uh, published in an academic journal, which means it was peer-reviewed, it was deemed to be of sufficient quality and impact to be published in an academic journal, and after it was published, it was taken down with no explanation. That is not okay. Um, that is not okay, and uh, we have to be mindful of the fact that science um, is an activity ran by people. It's a social activity, and as such, it's susceptible uh, to to the, the biases of the people who are in it. And it's not that we don't all run um, on our own personal assumptions and have our personal biases. However, um, these um, uh, the work on these areas of research has brought Forth. very interesting evidence even in the face of the obstacles that I was telling you about and they deserve to be more well known and this work deserves to be known deserves to be respected deserves to be funded and deserves to have competent people going into these areas to further these fields um, and treating these areas like a taboo topic, um, thinking that we shouldn't look at them just because it sounds weird or too woo-woo, that is not okay. Uh, it, is, it does a huge disservice to scientific progress and it does, a, it does a huge disservice to human progress and human welfare. How would we organize ourselves as a society differently if we knew for a fact that we are all more interconnected than we think that hurting you is quite literally if we knew that for a fact that hurting you is quite literally hurting me what other choices might we make in how we live our individual and collective lives how would our world look different um these are huge huge implications and I think this is so important um, that I have dedicated myself full-time uh, at the end of 2021 to dive into this work, to popularize it, to help demystify it, um, to help normalize these conversations, um, to um, help normalizing, sharing these experiences that we have that are not, that are out of the ordinary, uh, to not be afraid to bring up subjects such as telepathy or precognition, um, to think, to encourage thinking about the implications that the huge implications they might have for our world, and yes, to do this in a healthy, skeptical manner, uh, with true skepticism that demands evidence, but also that is willing to follow the evidence where it actually takes us, that is willing to change preconceived notions if the evidence demands it. Um, so I will wrap it up here. Um, I would just like to say that if you enjoyed this presentation and the topics that uh, we have talked about and you would like to follow uh, my work, I warmly invite you to follow me at wordfulwoman.com. Uh, I am mainly active on Instagram. I am also active on LinkedIn under Cristina A. Moraru. Um, please, uh, if you have any questions or comments, um, feel free to reach out um, you can also find you can find me on these two platforms, LinkedIn and Instagram at Word for Women. Uh, you can also find me 
via email at christina edward um, i also offer um, uh, office hours so each week i set aside time to connect one-on-one -on -one with um, anyone interested in the intersection between spirituality and science um, and um, this is an opportunity to dive deeper into the specific topics that you're interested in, to bring your specific questions. Uh, I'm always happy to share a resource or two um, on the topics that you are interested in. So I warmly invite you to book that. You can find that on my Instagram page. It is free to book. Um, thank you so much for your attention and I hope to connect with you soon. Have a lovely day.